Great. So hi, everyone. Welcome, David. We're very excited to have you here for our last Colloquium for the semester for EMO. Um, welcome, everyone, as well. And for a short introduction, Dr. David Defaloa Adelani is a DeepMind academic. He is a research fellow at the University College London and an incoming assistant professor at the McGill School of Computer Science in Canada. Um, Dr. Adelani is also super active in, in Masakane, a grassroots organization dedicated to advancing natural language processing uh, research in African languages. And he received his PhD in computer science from the Department of Language uh, Science and Technology from Zaarland University. His research primarily focuses on NLP for under-resourced languages, particularly those of Africa, which is going to talk about his recent work today on how good are large language models on African languages. Thank you, David. And I'll let you take it away from here. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Hannah, for the invitation and everyone part of the, um, of the team. Um, so I I used to remember it as MD for SDG, but it has not changed to E A A M O. Um, yeah. So thank you so much for the great work. So today I'll be presenting how good are large language models on African languages. Um, I believe every one of us uh, know about LLMs because it's a buzzword now, and um, uh, um, I, I'm sure the first time you try it, you may. I've tried it first in a high resource language like English. Um, and then you know that compared to any other LLM that we had prior to ChatGPT, something is unique about this LLM, which is the chat ability. You can ask questions in any, um, you can ask any question in a variety of topics, and it gives you um, a, a better result than previous versions of GPT. So here I asked who brought Ebola disease to Nigeria, and then uh, ChatGPT. I don't know if you're familiar uh, with Ebola disease. Um, it's a viral disease that was really deadly, and then when it came to Nigeria, there was a lockdown on an entire state. So this was quite uh, interesting. And then we want to know, okay, who brought this virus to the country? Uh, ChatGPT is able to remember this because it has been trained on such text. Uh, however, if you tried the same query in another language, like a low-resource language, like Yoruba language, the same query. Um, so actually, it's not able to get the answer because I asked it the same question in Yoruba. It gave me the answer. As a native speaker, I understand it. Uh, but if I ask it to translate it to English, and then you will see that uh, the answer in English and in Yoruba is very, very different. And the saying, if you translated that, although the translation seems uh, quite uh, correct, uh, but um, the information you're looking for cannot be found when you query in another language. So this is some of the current limitations we have for um, for large language model when you're querying in an under underrepresented language. And here he's saying that there's no recent news regarding an Ebola outbreak arriving in Nigeria, which is a wrong answer. So uh, other queries can be tested and you'll find similar pattern. So uh, we have different variants of large language models. So the word language model has been part of uh, NLP for long, uh, natural language processing. Actually the first, um, when I was studying NLP, maybe the first or the second lecture, in my class, we talk about language models. And it's a very simple concept that uh, in NLP we have been working on for so many years. And most of the breakthrough also in NLP is coming from this uh, uh, la uh, language model. So we have different kinds of language model and like representation models. Uh, the earlier ones are mostly called the encoder only ones, like the BERT model is a max language model where you're asked to predict the center word given the context. And then we have different variants of that. It's really quite active uh, around 2018 to 2022 before ChatGPT. And then we had another branch of model called the encoder decoder model, which is also very known in the literature because we use encoder decoder for machine translation. You want to translate something in one language and then you output it in another language. One of the famous models in that category is the T5 model <clears throat> by Google and the BART model. And one interesting thing with these models is that once they create the English-only model, they also create 
are a multilingual variant of the model. Typically, this multivariant, uh, multilingual variant often cover like 100 of languages. But these are like maybe the top languages with a lot of resources on Wikipedia. Another kind of model we have is the decoder-only model. Uh, and here you have different variants of model. We have the GPT-1, GPT-2, and then you have GPT-3. Um, and then you have different variants of models that we now have, like like blue model that was very popular, GPT-4, and we have BAD. It was previously BAD in 2023, but now it's called Gemini. And we have Cloud, and we have uh, Biantropic, and so many models. Um, and all these models are based on this architecture called the transform architecture. Transform architecture was initially created for uh, for uh, machine translation, but has applications in different aspects of NLP, uh, including computer vision and um, uh, computational biology. So NLP in a nutshell, what we typically do in NLP is that you do what is called self-supervised pre-training. You train on a bunch of texts. It's basically, you can take the entire Wikipedia text and train um, a self-supervised uh, model on it. Self-supervised means that you don't have a labor data. You try to construct a task that seems like a label uh, data, and then the model figures out. So <clears throat> if an example of such task is what is called mass language model. For example, if it says the chicken lays an egg, you can construct a supervised task, which is to predict chicken and an, and this forces the model to learn a good representation of that sentence, which is the chicken lesson. Apparently, if you, if you train this on a large amount of text, you can create a very good representation model that you can now fine tune on few amounts of downstream um, uh, tasks with few labeled examples. Um, in the bad age, mo most of the time, if you have a few thousand examples, you can get a very good model, uh, which is far better than anything you can achieve prior uh, to the birth model. Uh, actually, from 2020, uh, we have a new paradigm of model. The previous paradigm is called the pre-trained and fine-tuned model. You first pre-trained on unsupervised tasks, and then you cannot fine-tune on a specific task you're interested in, like sentiment classification or question answer. In the new paradigm, it's called pre-trained prompt um, uh, paradigm and predict. And in this paradigm, uh, what you do is that you can also do this self-supervised pre-training or what is called or next word prediction, for example, for the decoder on the model. Um, and then you can now prompt the model with without any example or with some examples. And after that, you, you need a verbalizer that is able to extract what you're interested in, the label, before you can get the task, because you can solve the task. So we call this the pre-training prompt and predict paradigm. The interesting thing with this kind of paradigm is that almost all NLP tasks can be casted into this. So like whether it's test classification or summarization, translation, any NLP task can be casted into this. Um, you can prompt for any NLP task. And actually this creates a lot of opportunity because you can have something like something more natural, a charts based application where you could ask a query to do any task and it gives you the answer. Whether for classification, I love this movie, what is the sentiment? What is the intent of what is the ties uh, here to Denver or a name recognition or to summarize an article or to translate from French to English? Um, but however, prompting is not only limited to left to right LLM. So most of the time when you prompt, you often believe that you need a like decoder-only model like ChatGPT or GPT-4, but you can also prompt other models. Um, like when I showed you uh, this diagram in the middle, we have the encoder only, we have the decoder only, and then in the middle, we have the encoder decoder. This branch of model can also be prompted. And an example of a popular model there is T0. And the idea is that if you construct um, all the available tasks that you know of in many languages or in a single language, if you can construct it to be in a question-answer format, then you can 
do what is called instruction tuning or what is called multitask fine tuning on several tasks. And this allows you to be able to prompt uh, this kind of model uh, for any task. So you can pick a summarization data. Uh, you construct it in form of question answer. Uh, for example, you write a prompt. What is the summary of this article? You give the text and then you give the summary. And then you can do the same for sentiment classification, for question answering, and for so many tasks. And this actually gives you um, a very good uh, model that you can prompt. So this kind of T0 model was created by uh, taking an encoder decoder model called T5 and then doing what is called multitask uh, and fine tuning it on multitask prompting data set. And that's how we go from T5 to T0. This can also be extended to the multilingual setting where we are from MT5, you can go to T MT0 or what is called uh, Flan T5. Flan T5 was created by Google and MT0 was created by uh, the open, by a bunch of academics from the open community. So this has also been applied to several models. We have from Palem, also a Google model to, uh, to Flan Palem, and then we have the uh, Blue model to BlueZek. And the idea is very simple. You pick a couple of examples of a task and then you construct it to be question answer with a prompt. And then you can jointly fine tune such a data set um, uh, on a very large encoder decoder model like T5. Okay, so, but that's not all we have achieved. There are some challenges of current LLMs. Uh, one is multilinguality. Many languages are not supported um, if you can see this, I, I'm trying to prompt uh, for a language called Lingala, and then it's telling me that this piece of text appears not to be written, uh, appears to be written in other language apart from English. So unfortunately, he's not able to understand it. Another problem is what is called reliability and factuality of LLMs. If you ask, who is the CEO of Twitter? And then it's asking me, okay, uh, as of my last update, uh, the CEO of Twitter is this person, uh, Jack Dorsey, and, no, and we know that the current CEO is not. Uh, so there's, there can be problems with how factual this LLM is. So uh, we also have hardware constraints because this LLM are getting bigger and bigger and it's difficult to fine tune it and deploy it. There are other issues, there's so many issues uh, like broken evaluation. We don't even know how to evaluate this model. Maybe they have also been trained on some test sets. There are some reports uh, recently that shows that the benchmark before ChatGPT, uh, uh, the GPT-4 is very good on it. And after the benchmark are created after, the model uh, perform a bit poorly on that. So uh, we could also have like privacy issues uh, where we have memorization of sensitive information. Um, when ChatGPT started, a lot of a lot of um, uh, chat conversation of people have been kept by OpenAI, and some of them may also consist of pri uh, private information. Maybe someone is asking for medical advice or legal advice, uh, which after actually expose their privacy. Uh, one other big issue which I'm going to talk a bit more is tokenization issues. Apparently, for um, for low resource languages, it costs more to to interact with a large language model than if you are prompting in English. So, if you prompt in a language that is non Latin, actually um, the tokenizer is not very good for this language, and actually costs more for you to tokenize uh, this language, and it, it's going to cost more for you. So other issues are we really need this model. We need democratization of these models. Uh, these models are closed. Uh, we want open versions of this model. So uh, I split my talk into two major challenges. Number one, lack of standardized data sets that we can even use to evaluate this model, especially for under resource languages. And our approach as a community is to use what is called a participatory research approach uh, where we involve grassroots community for developing benchmarks for our languages, for example, uh, African languages. The second challenge is that 
Uh, you see many languages and scripts are not supported and we have high rate of refusal. The model can decide not to answer you and say, I don't understand this language. So you cannot solve the task. And we have a lot of hallucination where you just spit out um, something that does not relate to the topic. And then um, actually one way to address this would be to adapt the current LLM to these languages. But before we do that, I think it's essential that we first evaluate how good are these LLMs for African languages. And that's the purpose of my talk. We really need to know how good are they, what are their weak points. And after that, we can develop uh, better models by leveraging uh, the current open models. Um, and of course, uh, the last one is, of course, LLM evaluation is costly, uh, both for GPU requirements. The good models are required a lot of memory. Uh, so it's the big, like the least usable model is seven billion parameter, which is already quite big. And people don't call it a big model nowadays. And then the ones that are very good in most tasks are start from 70 billion uh, parameters. It's really difficult. You need two A100 GPUs to actually run the that kind of model. And then of course you could apply for academic uh, API credit or we can only evaluate really small models. Okay, so the first one I'm going to present uh, one of my uh, work in 2021 on how we can actually uh, leverage participatory research with uh, grassroots community for developing uh, useful benchmarks for our languages. Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate this with name and recognition data sets for African languages. This is a collaboration with over actually 60 authors from Masakani. So, um, so uh, to present Masakani, the grassroots NLP community for Africans and by African, uh, and then we pioneer participatory research for African NLP. And we have been organizing an African NLP workshop at Top AI Conference. And we actually have one next week at Clear, And we have this every year. And we have over 2,000 members on Slack, about 100 are quite active. And we demonstrated in 2021 that how can we leverage this community uh, our community to create useful data sets for evaluating the performance of LLMs on African languages. So we built uh, Masakana. So prior to 2019, um, there were like zero of very few data sets for African languages. The ones that are available have been created automatically. So we needed something that, that is full, uh, human annotated for African languages. And in 2023, we have several data sets covering many tasks, name density recognition, path of speech, news topic classification. Uh, we have machine translation, sentiment classification. We have test to speech question answering, and we are still developing new benchmark. So during this period, uh, we had this African OP. And one of the things we identified during this workshop is that there's a lack of data and it's a really huge problem there because there was nothing to evaluate. When you want to work on Africa in OP, my first project, I had to create a data. There's nothing you can do. Create a data and then sub, and then come up with ideas. So you have to combine both. And there's also, that's what one of the th uh, key contributions of the Mascani community. So for the name and recognition, um, just to introduce the task, if you are all familiar with it, uh, is a token classification task and is a core task in uh, information extraction where you recognize entities in text like personal name, location, organization, or date. Um, the evaluation is typically done with F1 score. So on the right-hand side, you have an example. On the 4th of February, Global Voices visited Finland and Gomez. So you can identify dates, which is 4th of February, Global Voices uh, as an organization of Finland and Gomez as a person. Uh, so this is how the task has been constructed. So we created this project by asking volunteers from our community, mostly from Africa, to say, okay, you can contribute whether you're a native speaker or you're a linguist or you're ever a researcher, and let's try to uh, annotate some data for our languages. So in the first part of the data set, it's completely volunteer-based, where we call it Masakana 1.0. It consists of 10 African languages, um, we have like around five on, from West Africa, Aousa, Ibo, Yoruba, Nigeria, Pigeon, and Wolof. 
and we have the other five on East Africa. And this was done by volunteers. That if you're interested, can you um uh, um can you annotate a few hundreds of sentences for your language? And then we a few people agreed, and then we kind of uh provide the annotation guideline and support them with the annotation too. However, after doing this, you know, we noticed that um many re some regions of Africa are actually missing in evaluation. For example, the central part of Africa and southern part of Africa. And the interesting thing is that they have very, very different linguistic structures. So we decided to expand the data set to Moscana 2.0, which now consists of uh, 20 African languages. Uh, number one, we expanded um, the language, the languages. Uh, so you see the languages we expanded to are in pink color, and then we also increase the size of the original data set. And this has been funded by an organization called Lacuna Fund, who is funding data set creation. So the lesson is that if you really want to scale to many languages, uh, sometimes it's hard to use volunteers. Um, so we uh, write grants to see that if we can have organization to fund this data set creation. So, however, we have done all this work and then we notice that when uh, we have popular, when this large language model revolution came, um, the kind of benchmarks are very, very different. Uh, so if you see the benchmark, for, for example, for Cloud Day, uh, GPT-4, Gemini, the kind of tasks they evaluate on are very different from what we have created data set for. For example, nobody's evaluating um, nobody's really evaluating on things like NER again uh, as before, which was a very, very popular benchmark uh, in the past. So and so uh, we see new benchmarks that we need to consider and we need to uh, produce so that we can really benchmark uh, LLMs um, uh, nowadays. So another popular benchmark is the XNLI that has been used by this MT0 and Bloom uh, model. So, uh, but for, they only cover maybe one African language. MGSM covers just Swahili, XNLI only covers Swahili. So we decided to see how we can, and also MMLU, which is one of the most popular data sets, actually to such an extent that if, your model doesn't perform well on MMLU, you don't really announce it. And some people are actually protesting that MMLU is not performance. It's, it's, you cannot use a single uh, data set to judge the performance of a new LLM. So just to tell you how important uh, knowledge QA is for evaluating LLMs. So we decided to create a new benchmark called Iroko Bench. Uh, Iroko is a wood, uh, a type of tree in West Africa, uh, which is a very, very hard uh, tree. So, and that's where you can also use it to make bench, uh, where what people sit on. So that's how the name came from. And then uh, Iroko bench is a translated benchmark covering three tasks, assisting typologically diverse African languages. So we cover new benchmark, Afri XNLI, which is natural language in France, for example, um, if you have a premise, uh, hypothesis, you can label the relationship. Is this a contradiction or entailment to nature? So if someone says, so I'm not sure uh, why, and someone says, I'm certain, so that's a contradiction. And then you can have a neutral relationship, which doesn't really talk. Um, it's, it's similar, but actually it's referring to something else. And the last example here, you will see that it clearly entails each other. I'm not really sure why, and someone says, I don't know why, so which is really talking about each other. So this is um, a very simple task for humans, but for large language models uh, may be difficult if they cannot really reason properly in that language. So it's a really useful benchmark. The other data set, which is mathematical reasoning, I really love it. If you like math, of course, you will like this benchmark. And an example is this. Uh, maybe James decides to run three sprints three times a week. He runs 60 meters each sprint. 
how many total meters does it run? So if I give you one minute to, to solve this problem, I'm sure you will come up with the answer. Um, so the answer is uh, 540. So the third benchmark is uh, uh, MMLU, which is a knowledge-based QA. They can ask a question like this, which of the following countries generated the most total energy from solar sources in 2019? And the category is from a global fact. And then we have a couple of options and the answer is A. And this benchmark, uh, this new benchmark is also being funded by LACMA. So, uh, but first I will talk about how good are uh, LLMs on African languages. So my initial focus will be on the previous benchmarks we have created before the large language model H. And I'm going to give you some examples of how they perform on uh, the new benchmark. Do we have questions on the first part? Thank you, David. I have a question. Um, in the meantime, oh, when you, uh, you mentioned this need for human annotators of languages, since like in in the early stages of collecting more information, uh, or or automatizing African languages into the system, um, it was done in an automated way. And I wonder what is a good way to add human annotators, given the diversity and the the amount of different data that there may be a need for collecting. Okay, that's a really good question. Um, so it's a really difficult problem. So of course, for example, like I told you, like some of the the early work we did participatory research, but as we continue to build benchmark, we see that it's not sustainable to just rely on just completely volunteer. So we try to get the the the, the data set collection to be funded, and once it's funded, then we can reach out to um, colleagues or partners in different regions of Africa and have a more uh, systematic and um, benchmark that covers multiple languages. This is what we're doing. But when there's one, if you, someone is passionate about the language, we can also suggest how to create this benchmark that is not very costly and the person is able to achieve his aim. Uh, so, thank you. Yeah, thank you. If anyone has any other questions, please uh, raise your hand, unmute, or add them to the chat. All right. Okay, can I? Uh, okay. Can, should I ask a question, or should we continue? Yeah, you can ask, please. Hi, this is just phenomenal stuff. Thank you so much for bringing it to us. You know, I've been very optimistic about the prospect of sort of translation, but like thought and style translation from West Common Languages. And I'm thinking about like students uh, at the University of Washington who I work with, who are using English not as their first language uh, and how exhausting that that must be for them sometimes. Uh, like the prospect of being able to just jot down some notes in their native language and then ask an AI, to do a sort of translation, but also translation of style to turn those notes into like a uh, email to an advisor or a uh, introduction to a scholarly paper. Um, and I wonder if you think about that in a different way than all of the challenges that's, that you've raised here, because I'd never thought about before how sort of like the knowledge that uh, chatbots are able to deliver in English is going to be different in other languages, or even the way it's just more expensive. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the kind of, with okay. that perspective. Yeah, just what do you think I should be watching out for? Thanks again so much. Yeah. Um. Definitely. Like I showed you, even from the first example, there's a big difference. Uh, in the knowledge or difference, uh, of the chatbot in different languages. Uh, the style is important, of course. Also. I mean, there are some issues if you try to create benchmark just by translating, um, because you you don't really capture uh, the cultural aspect of this data set when you're, when you're translating. So of course, it, 
of course, there are some issues uh, like that. So, but in terms of um, uh, the style, is something that can actually lead to some degradation in performance across different languages, and it's something to really watch watch out for. And of course, if you want to create benchmark, I wouldn't suggest that you will use some Im uh, immigrants into US that do not, um, I mean, the person may know how to speak the language uh, from their parents, but it may not be fully exposed to the culture of those people speaking the language. So uh, it's better to create a language where uh, the benchmark where you really have many native speakers and they really have very good understanding of the cultural aspect or, or different concepts in their language. I hope I'm able to answer the question a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's one more question from Carolina in the chat. I'll read it out loud. Uh, what kind of data format could work for manually annotating data? Also, could you show us how the grammar structure of one of the studied languages looks like? Um. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't have the grammar structure now, um, but the format is often very uh, similar to English. You know, if you have the question answer format, or you have um, uh, two pairs of sentence and you want to know the relationship between them, the format is usually very uh, similar. The grammar is different, the script is different, and these issues one needs to pay attention to. So, especially when you want to do transfer learning from one language to the other. A lot of things can go wrong if the script is different, um, if the morphological structure is different. Um, I don't have numbers here today just because I was focusing on LLMs. But in my previous work, uh, we have actually focused on uh, this kind of issues where transfer learning fails for very different languages. Yeah. Oh, OK, JSON, I mean, the format uh, doesn't really matter. It could be CSV, JSON, and one platform is trying to standardize this process, like organ phase data sets. I don't know if you are aware of this. They try to standardize it. So whether you use JSON or CSV, a user can load the data sets in any format. All right, so let me jump to this. Um, um, I, I, I will not be able to anything, another question now. Yeah. So how good are LLMs for African languages? So this is a collaboration with Jessica Ojo, uh, Kalichi Ugriji, Ponto Stenotop, uh, and myself from UCL. So, yeah, we have different uh, LLMs here. We don't really have the encoder models. So the, any model you find here is what we currently call large language model these days. So the models are typically encoder decoder model and the decoder model. Some of them are publicly available. The ones highlighted, many of them are not especially uh, models backed by OpenAI, Google, and other companies. Uh, of course, we have so many LLMs now. now I don't even know the counts at the moment, uh, but how good are they on African languages? So we did some evaluation on some encoder-decoder models. So these encoder-decoder models are based on T5XSL. Um, XSL means they have like at least 13 billion parameters. And we have two variants of models there, MT0 and IA model that was developed by Cohere for AI with a lot of volunteers. So we also have decoder-only models like Llama. We have now three versions of Llama, Llama 1, Llama 2, Llama 3, and which is really popular, uh, and GPT-4. So uh, I've tried to separate, like, categorize them in different tables here. We have for training uh, African data that these models have been trained on um and then uh we also have the number of african languages they have been trained on um and then i think there's an error here this should be pre-training languages and then um languages they have been fine-tuned on and then we have Af Af african languages in pre-training and then african languages covered in supervised fine-tuning and you see for the Lama 2 model, we actually do not know uh, how many African languages uh, it has been trained on. MT0, because it's an open model, this as a paper, everything is well documented. But the recent models, we have no idea. For GPT-4, everything is unknown. The parameter is unknown. The number of protein data is unknown. The language cover is unknown. 
the African language discoveries or not. And this is a problem if you especially if you want to reproduce this kind of model. All right. So the IR model is um quite interesting because uh this is a year-long work by different grassroots organization and different uh, community members that try to perform some annotation and also contribute some prompted data set for their languages. And they have fine-tuned on several data sets and also evaluated on many data sets. And you see that some of the benchmark they have evaluated on, like we have the XNLI, we have the MMLU, which are really common these days. And I'm going to show some results also on this. So MT0, IA is very similar to MT0 because they fine tune on different tasks. And this actually helps the model to generalize to new tasks. Uh, but IA is slightly different from MT0 because they also This benchmark, um, I'll, I'll focus on different uh, this task. We have Masakani News, Topic Classification, uh, SIB 200 covers like 56 African languages. We have Sentiment Classification covers 14. We have Masakana, uh, uh, where it covers 20 African languages. Um, we have Africa Wave, which is based on question answering. We have Machine Translation, we have Summarization. And also we have the new benchmark, mathematical reasoning, multi-choice QA, and natural language inference. Okay, so about four of them are kind of generative, like QA, we actually want to generate the answer, machine translation, summarization, and mathematical QA, you want to generate the answer. And generative tasks are more difficult than classification tasks. So, uh, this is the way we evaluate the models. Number one, we want to see how far is the model from the state of the heart. So typically, the state of the art model follows this architecture. You fine tune on a couple of tasks. Sorry, you fine tune on some data sets in that language. And then you can now evaluate. That is often the best you can do. Uh, for LLMs, you only have to prompt in that language. Now we want to see how, what is the performance gap if you prompt in English versus if you prompt in an African language. So with these two, we can know how good uh, are these LLMs on African languages. How far are you from the state of the art if you have data, training data, and what's the performance gap to English? Okay, for the first task, new topic classification. If you have a text like this, five things to know about Nigeria, uh, a new Nera note, this is a business news. Uh, John Boyega, Don Win, an icon, uh, GQ uh, icon award, this is more of an entertainment news. Uh, AstraZeneca vaccines, uh, side effect blood clot. Of course, this is definitely an house news. And then UFR, anything about UFR, Liverpool is about sport news. So, but how good is LLMs on this task? It's a very, very simple task. We prompt the model like this. Labels only is this piece of news regarding business, entertainment, health, politics, religion, sports, or technology. We provide the headline of the news and we provide the article body. And then you can see across different LLMs, the best you can do if you have training data is the solid uh, orange bar that you have. And you see that um, the only model that is very close to this is GPT-4. And surprising, Aya did very, very well on this task. Um, so there are many reasons I, I really I checked the data set because everything is open. Um, they have trained on this uh, on the text of this corpus, but they have not trained on the task. So I don't really know how training on the corpus makes it generalized to understanding this task more. But it's interesting to see that Aya performed very well on this, while the other models perform very poorly. So, uh, however, if you see for non-Latin base script, you see Amarike has a very poor result, especially for Lama. And the reason is that Lama 
all the focuses on mostly high resource languages. Like most of the pre-training token is around 90% of English. And then the others is code and others. Uh, and for the other languages that are covered, they're very, very tiny. And I'm sure that America is not covered on pre-training. So also you see that GPT-4 sometimes perform worse on languages that have less resources on the web. So we have an example of Lingala. So if you compare Lingala to Swahili, it has less resources. There's less resources for Lingala compared to Swahili and Yoruba, and also the performance of GPT-4 also reflect that. Okay. So um, the second task is topic classification. Uh, it's very similar to the first task I showed you, but the sentences are shorter. You just have a single sentence. You don't have an article, an headline, just a simple sentence. And then we have like um, actually seven categories now. Um, if you look at the performance, the prompt is very similar to the first one. Uh, the best model is still Alpha XNMRO when you have training data. And you see that all the language, all the other models perform very poorly, especially GPT-4. That means if you have a very short text with not a lot of context, like all the LLMs perform very poorly. Uh, and GPT-4 actually perform worse than IA and MT0. Interestingly, you find out that, um, especially for Atlantic Congo languages, which consists of like 34 languages, Mandarin group, which are very, very low resource, Nilotti group, which are also very low resource, the performance of GPT-4 is very, very low, uh, which shows that they do not perform very well for languages that they have not been seen during pre-training. Um, so we move to another task called sentiment classification where you want to classify the performance of a text into positive, negative, or neutral. Evaluation is, uh, is still on F1 score. Uh, this is an example. For example, someone says somebody is mischievous and convictuous, and that's a negative sentiment. And someone said, I have a crush on this beautiful woman. That's a positive sentiment. And then what's the performance of LLM on this task? The best result is the Alpha XLMR, uh, which is one of the state of the art for um, encoder only model for African languages. And then we say, does this language statement have a positive, negative, or neutral sentiment? And here, across all the different LLM, um, GPT-4 um, is very good. Uh, uh, it's good on this task, not very good, but it's uh, decent on this task. Um, but we see that Lama consistently is very bad. For Amharic, the performance is really low because it doesn't support the script. And for the lang other languages, the performance is really low. That is actually not very useful because if you have a performance less than 40, it's really, really low. Okay. Um, but another thing we can see is that now IA seems to be very good for topic classification then. And now in, in this task, it has very similar performance with MT0 in general. So for the nameless recognition, I already described the task, which is about identifying entities like dates, organization, or person in text. Um, and we have a text, uh, a prompt. For nameless, it's a bit difficult. So we needed to provide an example. And an example is like, um, we define the task, which is called task description. Nameless refers to the names of location, organization, and personal name. And then we say, for example, David is an employee of Amazon and is visiting New York next week to see Esther. So this can be tagged as person, David, organization. So we give it an example on how to, to perform this task. And still, despite giving it an example, we see that the performance of all the LLMs are very, very poor. GPT-4 is the only one that kind of has like an average performance uh, because the numbers are a bit high. But for the other LLMs, the performance are really, really low. So uh, that is for token classification, LLMs are often very bad at it. And I believe you also have similar performance for a task like part of speed tagging. So, uh, okay, sorry, sorry. This is not an example of question answering. Okay, this is a question answering. Um, uh, this is a problem for question answering. And here we perform two experiment, number one, we say, what if you ask the question in an African language? 
So the task, this task is what is called cross-lingual um, question answering. The, uh, imagine that you're asking a question in an African language from a document that is in English. So we want to see if we can are uh, able to retrieve the correct answer from an English Wikipedia. And you see that for all the LLMs, uh, it's really hard. The best results we can achieve if you fine tune on English data is MT5. And surprisingly, you see that GPT-4 also struggles a lot for this task. Surprisingly, smaller models like MT0 and AYA actually perform better on this task, uh, reaching very high F1 score, like 60, 70 on this task. Uh, if you ask the question in English, basically, if you uh, translate this question in English, you see that the performance are higher. That means GPT-4 is, uh, is not able to reason properly about this if the language that you're asking is, yeah, you're using to ask a question is um, in an African language. So uh, another task we evaluated on is summarization. Uh, this is an example. Um, uh, this is the headline, and then you have a long uh, description about the news. But BBC often have a very short summary here in bold color. Uh, which kind of gives you a gist about the text. This is how the Excel sum was created. You have a bunch of text uh, talking about an event, and then you have a short summary in bold, and they extracted it to create a summarization data set. So on this task, um, MT5 base is the best result if you have training data. And, and on this task, you see that um, most of the models are not able to reach the state of the hard performance. Uh, GPT-4 really struggle uh, on this task. And surprising, like um, simpler model or models that do not have a lot of parameters like GPT-4, like IR model, actually per perform very well on this task. We eliminated MT-0 because MT-0 has trained on this data set, so we removed it. So that because of uh, uh, contamination. Okay, so another task we evaluated on is machine translation. You have a text like this. I'm giving a talk today, and this is a translation in Swahili. I don't know if it's correct. I prepared it today, so um, uh, I'm not a Swahili speaker. But this is an interesting. Uh, if you prompt, uh, if you asked um, for translation um, in a high resource language like German, if you say German to English in the first part, uh, the performance are really high, especially for GPT-4, for higher and M2M100. However, for African languages, I intentionally put Swahili there. You can see that the numbers are also pretty high for Swahili because it has a lot of resources on the web. However, for tree language, uh, you see that the performance is much lower. And if you go to the other direction, from English to an African language, you will see that uh, the numbers are lower. For German, the performance is very really good. Um, however, for African language, Swahili is still pretty good. And you can see um, that GPT-4 really struggles for Swahili. The number is very low when you are trying to translate into Swahili. And that means, and on average, the performance of GPT-4 is very low on translation. Surprisingly, um, models like MT0 and IR actually did better than GPT-4 on machine translation. Okay, uh, these are our key findings. Uh, you can agree with me based on what I've showed you that there's a large gap between high resource languages and African languages. Although the uh, this gap is minimal for tasks like summarization, news topic classification and sentiment classification. Because you have a model like IA did very well for summarization, GPT-4 did very well on news topic classification. Um, IA and MT0 are better than GPT-4 and LAMA on generative task. For summarization and machine translation, we find that the IA and MT0 did very good. If you find some using multilingual prompts, uh, I mean, if you create the model using multilingual prompts, actually it gives better performance than. So multilingual prompt is that you, you add 
different languages in your training data, not only in English. Ah, so multilingual prompts actually get better results. So MT0 and IR actually is better performance than the state of the art of cross lingual QA, even better than um, uh, GPT-4. Uh, so you cannot assume that GPT-4 is the best on every task, at least in the case of African languages, this is not the case. Maybe in, uh, in German language, this is the case, but African languages, sometimes you have the older models uh, better. Uh, I have like similar performance to MT0 in general, um, except on one topic classification data set. Lava 2 often struggles, um, the performance is often lower than other LLMs just because uh, of the limited multilingual abilities, especially for non Latin languages like Hamaric. And we find that all models struggle with token classification tasks like uh, NEL, GPT 4 has like an average performance. So these are some qualitative examples uh, where we see that some models actually hallucinate or just decline to answer, like Lama 2. It says, I apologize, but I cannot provide a translation for this sentence. And also for sentiment classification, uh, some models are trying to try to do another thing. Um, for like this bacteria X tries to do something else. And some will just hallucinate, like in the Swahili case, um, uh, just hallucinate. So on the newer benchmarks, we find similar trends. So I don't want to spend much time on this, just to tell you that even for the newer benchmark that people like to evaluate on, we have a similar trend, but we can see uh, that GPT-4 has uh, the performance gap compared to other models are, are wider uh, compared to, for example, uh, if you see the performance, the blue bar on average. Also for the mathematical reasoning, you see that GPT-4 performance is wider compared to other models. So you can see from, if you compare the older benchmark and the newer benchmark, there's some difference. Uh, and also for uh, MMLU evaluation, you can also see that GPT-4 performance is much wider uh, than the other uh, LLMs. So in summary, we tackle these two challenges uh, for LLMs in African languages I will pass, uh, propose perspective um, uh, research approach by leveraging community efforts to, be, to address the first challenge and to perform the second, uh, for the second challenge, we try to perform extensive evaluation to see how good are they on African languages. And our future work is to see how we focus on adapting open models to more African languages. Thank you. All right. That's the end of my talk. Thank you so much, David. That was really inspiring. And, and particularly this participatory research approach with grassroots communities that you mentioned is, is speaks a lot to our community and it, it's really inspiring to see all your work you've done on this. All right, we have a couple of uh, moments for uh, minutes for questions. Uh, please raise your hand again or ask your question directly here or in the chat. Um, maybe I'll start with one, which is, uh, um, you mentioned this difference on, on Lama 2 particularly doing uh, bad on African languages. Do you have a sense of why certain models did like better than others? And and uh, how can we evaluate this better? I know benchmarking in general seems a, like a very interesting direction of future work. And I wonder what are your thoughts specifically on, on these different model evaluations? Yeah, that's a good question. For Lama, the answer is simple. They have not been trained on these languages. This is my guess or they have been trained on very, very tiny amount of these uh, languages. Uh, because like for Lama 2, it was reported in the paper that 90% are from English language. And then the other maybe 8% from code, then the others are very, very tiny. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, tokenization. Someone asked, asked a question on the chat. Tokenization is a... Uh, interesting problem, especially for non-Latin scripts. If your language uses a Latin script, actually it's not a big deal for, for these LLMs. But if your language uses a non-Latin script like G script in Ethiopia, uh, for Amharic or Tigrinya or um, some Unco script or the Tifnal uh, script in North Africa, then yeah, there will be some issues and the performance will be really, really terrible. Uh, that it's better to train um, 
a simple naive base for your task <laughs> that you know, and then because the tokenization doesn't work. Yeah. Hey. Yes, we are on time. Um great. If there's any other questions, everyone please let us know. Oh, there's a question from Charles in the chat as well. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, there are many uh, issues, of course. They, are, they still need a lot of effort on data creation for African languages. Because one of the reasons why they are not included in Pritchard is because we don't have enough data. <laughs> so I think this is one problem. We have compute issues because this one are getting bigger. And most, even this research sometimes is harder to do if you are in African university because there's just not compute. Uh, this is some issues, and that means uh, in the LLM age, it's actually more difficult to compete with European universities or Western universities because of the compute gap. And these are really difficult problems to address. Okay, thank you so much. I'll stop sharing. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. This was really inspiring. Thank you, everyone, for asking questions and for engaging. And uh, um, this was our last colloquia for, for the semester, but stay tuned for the talks to be posted online. And as always, send us suggestions for other talks you'd like to see. I think we're right on time. So it's um, it's really great to see you all here. Bye. Thank you again. Thank you and goodbye.